They say everything in life is created twice, first in our mind and then in reality. And I'm excited to bring with you here a growth strategist, Simon Lewis. How are you, Simon? Good morning. Nice to meet you. Same, same here, buddy. Um, Simon has uh, worked to, uh, in advising the president of Emirates Group um, and Danata on change and strategy between a quite a uh, significant period of time. Yeah, 11, 11 years almost. Yeah. 11 years. And today, um, we're here to just share some of the main ideas that have taken such a giant into where it is today. But more excitingly, is, is can these principles be applied to your businesses? So we're going to discover this together. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. Simon, um, again, uh, I said everything is created twice, first in someone's mind, then in reality. What are the elements of creating the future? What do we call that? Wow. Okay. I mean, I think in business, it, it, it comes down to having a very clear vision of where you want to go and mm -hmm. what you want to achieve. And then that's supported by a mission, which really focuses where people are going to activate their, their contribution to achieve that vision. And then obviously a set of values, which brings all those people together to work um, harmoniously, one hopes, but certainly develop a culture uh, within the business that is and should be customer-centric mm -hmm. to the needs of their customers as well. You know, what you said is music to my ears. And one of the things I'll, I'll mention here, you know what, Simon, I've been in many organizations where I walk into their offices and I can see a vision and mission and values. But it's not actually making things happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's not enough to just have it. How do we actually activate that uh, in uh, further so that it's rooted within the organization? So, so there's... there's Two areas to focus on, I would suggest. One is on the leadership, mm -hmm. and then it's also on the people. Um, all too often I've seen uh, you know, good, solid statements being written for a vision, mission, and values, uh, and there's a little bit of hype behind it. Everybody gets pumped, and then sort of after the opening ceremony, mm -hmm. <laughs> it all suddenly goes flat and, and, and loses momentum. Let's focus on the leadership first. So on the leadership, they've got to be behind them. They've got to be behind the vision, mission, and values. If they're not, you, you've got a weak link in the chain. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that that person needs to move on. Perhaps that person needs to be refocused on what you know, the, the direction of the company is going in and indeed where their contribution is going to make a difference. Can you elaborate a bit more on that leadership? So if the leader is not fully in tune with the mission and vision. Um, and you know, a lot of the work I do is with sales leaders, mm. right? And of course, you have the mission vision to be the number one XYZ type of company of, of our kind in this part of the world or mm. to be the go-to. But then the leaders are, in a way, um, forget about that mission and vision and more importantly, the values. And they just focus on results. So now they become, sorry to say this, but they just looking at the numbers, not mm. the people that are making the numbers come to life. Yeah. Any, any way, anything yeah, you can I, elaborate for us on that? I, I, what I find interesting is, um, you know, I study leadership models. And, you know, the latest ones are transformational, authentic leadership, all of those types of things. Ultimately, they always return back to um, three key words that I was introduced to um, when I sort of took my first official class in leadership, if you wish, uh, which is at uh, the Royal Military Academy Santos. And those three words are served to lead. Mm -hmm. And I think all too often today, uh, as leaders go up the organization, they often forget about the importance of serving to lead the people that they are responsible for. And they do get focused on the numbers, they do get, which is natural because they're under a lot of pressure. Yet, if they actually get the people around them and talk about the issues, talk about the challenges, and listen to what those people are saying, often they're coming straight from the front line. And it's like anything in, in a military operation. If you've got the up-to-date information of what's happening on the front line, you're better equipped to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So likewise, in business, if you're getting 
data and information from the front line, one, those people feel empowered. That they're feel listened to, feel important, that they're exactly. contributing, yes. And when they see that contribution actually being turned into action, then it actually becomes more powerful. But suffice to say that often leaders tend to operate at, uh, at a senior level, who tend to operate at a senior level, because they've been there and they've done that, got the T-shirt, if you wish, you know, listening to the front line perhaps isn't foremost on their agenda. Mm. And it's perhaps listening to the pressure of the shareholder, listening to the pressure of the market. Um, and, of course, you know, Newton's law of, of physics, you know, to every action there's an opposite reaction. If you go down as a leader and you start sort of chastising your people for not working hard enough and not getting the sales in, how are they going to respond? Well, they're going to t most probably forget about the values and go well, hell for leather to get the sales in. <laughs> Ultimately, that night she might get the sales in, but at what damage? What collateral? Well, you might have lost some customers along the way because once you made that sale today, they might not come back tomorrow. Absolutely. You know, you got the, the what and how. <clears throat> what is can you get the sales? The how is the, are these behaviors? You know, are we being customer centric? Are we listening? To customer needs? Are we aware of uh, their existing need, but how about their future needs, which then can be fed back into the organization to, to make corrective actions and bring new products, bring new ideas, all with the same objective to be number one. So it's not about being number one today and that's it. Uh, number one is like a, uh, is a moving target. You might be number one today, but doesn't mean you're going to wake up and be number one tomorrow. And that's what many leaders need to, uh, to uh, uh, remember. Um, you mentioned something about how the entire journey started for you. So uh, uh, can you go back in time and tell us a little bit about this uh, lead to serve? So how did the serve to lead? Yeah. Serve to lead. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, uh, I started my professional career in the military. I, um, at the age of 18, I went to um, the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. And I, I sort of remember on the very first day, you know, we, there was about 90 of us um, that made a a company, a rifle company, effectively. And we were ushered into this beautiful oak panelled room with wonderful pictures of the military up there and that sort of stuff. And we're all in our civilians, you know, some in suits, some in sports jackets, ties. And in walked the company commander, a major. Um, and we all stood up. Now, as we entered that room, we, we got given a little red book, which is about the size of your notebook there, A5 size. And on it was the uh, crest of Sandhurst. And below it, the words serve to lead, written in silver, embossed in mm -hmm. silver. And uh, the, the, the company commander, the major um, from the Gurkha, sort of stood up and said, gentlemen, you know, congratulations on getting to Sandhurst. You know, you're in the top 10 percentile of the recruitment pool now. Now, this was back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, please do not think that you've passed this course. Interesting. You've actually just started your learning. And to help you, and when you find times difficult, you've got a book that you've been issued with. Um, you don't have to give it back. It's yours for life. And in it are anecdotes of leaders and of people who have been led, not always in the military, in civilian life as well, passing their comments and ideas and beliefs on. Use it wisely. Mm. And, you know, I still have that book today. Um, I still refer to it um, because it is about putting others before yourself in order that you can lead. Can you, um, uh, thank you so much for sharing. It's very, very, very inspiring. And, you know, is there any one particular uh, quote that helped bring, that helped you in bring about this um, you know, serve to lead or lead to serve. Sorry, I keep serve to lead. <laughs> I keep no, no, no. Servant leadership. Okay, serve to lead. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Look, the, the, there's one which actually is a JFK quote mm -hmm. from 1962, which is the uh, um, Cuban crisis, and he he said, um, you know, there are risks and problems to every process of action but they are far less than the challenges of comfortable inaction, something like that. Mm -hmm. In other words, that you know, if you're going to do something, there will be risks and problems, but if you don't do something, there are going to be far greater consequences. Yeah. 
um, and therefore, as a you know, when, when in a position of a, of being a leader, you've got to make that decision. You've got to go for it. But in the process, how you've reached that decision is is, is crucial. And I think that um, you know, in, in conversations I've had with with many people um, who've asked me about you know, the military experience, there's a strong belief that it's very autocratic, and you know, whatever the command is, you follow. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth, and you know, I was, I was most probably in the most um, challenging of, of leadership roles in the infantry, where you're dealing with, you know, and looking after the lives of 30 men. Um, and whenever you got an operation, yes, you'd go away and you'd figure out how you're going to do it. But before you delivered it to your men, you'd get your corporals and sergeants around and you'd say, this is how I see it now. Have I missed anything? Is there any way I, where we can improve upon it? Or are you all comfortable and we can get in front of them and make it happen? And of course, invariably they come back, you know, boss, you need to think about this, you need to think about that. Got that, got that. Or no, I disagree because I think this is more important at the stage. If you're comfortable with that, you know, let's crack on. If you're not, we're still going to crack on. But I've got the, the agility to, mm -hmm. to, to change if you, if you see it happening. Um, and away you go. And, you know, one of the, you know, last year was the 40th year of the Falklands War, um, which was, you know, uh, a unique event in, in British military history. Um, and one of the real learning points that came out from that was that when, you know, in the infantry, the guys got stuck in, the leaders, the platoon commanders, actually had little effect. It was down to the corporals and the you know, lance corporals of, 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 on the ground directing and, and following through. And the same applies in business. And whilst you can get somebody with a you know, powerful business title, ultimately it's those people on the ground that are doing the sales, that are getting the, the, the monies in and, and getting the job done. So how do you, as a leader, get with those people? Well, you've got to get down to the front line. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be with them at some stage, and you know my my boss in 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 Donata, he he was remarkably good at having a walk around once a week. He would just walk around the offices. Didn't have to. So who is that boss? That was a chap called Gary Chapman. Okay, and so that's the big the uh, yeah yeah he was president of Emirates Group yeah, Services absolutely. in Donata. So and, uh, so just going down, talking with the troops, and just seeing what's going on. Yeah, just asking. <clears throat> Um, always approachable, and one of the things I will always remember when we when we kicked off the One Donata program, which was a transformation program for Donata, I called him up and said, "Gary, would you be willing to have a breakfast mm -hmm. with ten or twelve people from across the Donata business and group services, and just shoot the breeze, just talk about anything? Uh, and obviously, if you can't talk about it, you can say, or if it's too confidential, you can say." But talk about it. And he said, love to. Amazing. And then every month thereafter, we got 12 people in um, who could fire questions at Gary about the business, about, about his life, about where he wants, you know, where he sees Donata going. Um, and to qualify to get on that, you actually had to demonstrate how you were using the Donata values in your place of work. Real simple, but very effective. Quite inspiring, quite inspiring. Just uh, the the openness of uh, Gary, mm. jumping onto that opportunity, and I can imagine the the type of uh, bond that now he's having with multitudes of different people within the organization, connecting with the leader of that organization. Uh, basically, he's having his pulse, you know, his finger on the pulse. The people, mm. what are they? What's going on? But also the, that level of, I would say, two-way uh, communication between the people and that leader of that organization. You know, so um, um, le let me let me ask you a question. A lot of time, uh, leaders get stuck in their own ways. So this is maybe not. It's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm too busy for these things. What 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 do you say to that? Wow. I yeah. I think um, one of the the key aspects of, a, of an effective leader is that they're always willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you, you look at the way 
um, the generations are changing from X and Y to you know, the, the, the current. Z, or I think, Z, or, or yeah. <laughs> which. Um, and here are we at tender age, not fully, no, we are, we are on, on top of it. But it gets back down to, I think, what you value. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, yeah, we've all had friends who, who've had, you know, challenges in their marriage and that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the friends I've spoken to, I've always said, return to the values that you first got married on. Mm. Now, if, if they've gone, then fair enough. But if they're still there, then there's a glimmer of hope that you can return to those and, 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 and work through the problem. And I think the same applies for a leader in business. If the leader understands what he or she values and they're still aligned with the business, mm -hmm. but perhaps they're not being employed as, as often, then it's that person's responsibility to take a, a step back. That's where the challenge is because sometimes it's difficult and that's where you know, a friend, a coach, mm -hmm. somebody can actually sort of say, well, have a look at this. Have you considered? And just like a good sports coach, you know, it's not about changing everything. It's about changing a couple of parts of, of, of how they go about things to be really effective. And suddenly things will actually progress a lot better. Um, I find it interesting that, you know, often people don't, leaders don't, delegate enough, mm -hmm. um, thinking it's important for them to be in the center of everything. So what does that do for the business, for the people, Ooh. for the uh, culture? Well, I mean... For the development or lack of it, for that, <laughs> for that uh, matter. One, obviously, there's a, an unconscious sense that there's a lack of trust. Because mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't delegate, they are, they're indicating that perhaps they don't trust people. Mm -hmm. Um, two, for the people who can see what needs to be done but are not being asked to get it done, they, there develops a lack of motivation right. and a frustration mm -hmm. with, with the setup. And invariably, people can only tolerate that for so long before they give up the ghost and say, right, I'm off. And that's where your retention problems come in. Um, and in, in, in that process, of course, when you start to lose talent from the business, so your culture gets diluted. Mm -hmm. you know, the vision and mission and the execution of that gets diluted because you've got to bring new people in and they're going to take three to six months to... To figure it out, to, to kind of go, go with the flow. To, to warm up and, and, and do all of that sort of thing. So, you know, it, it is about the leader being able to serve others in order to be effective. Mm -hmm. How can he or she serve others? Well, delegation is one, one area. And actually, um, you know, delegation and empowerment uh, go hand in hand. And so if as a leader I've got a task and I, you know, I'm absolutely genuine, am I the best person that can complete that task? Mm -hmm. Not always. That's right. But there is somebody that I do trust, somebody that I'd love to see perform that. So I'm going to give that to that person. And look, if they go off track a bit, I'm here to help them. I'm here to keep it on track. And look, that's what Gary did for me. He actually sort of said, look, Simon, come and set up and run one donata. Um, you know, the, Im implement the one donata transformation. And that was getting around all the business leaders and making sure it was all done. But if I was ever going off track, he, he would call me in and say, you know, let's get back on track. Um, or I want you to do this, which is his way of saying, yeah, you need to go and do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a real effective leadership style. But it certainly grew my awareness and capabilities in, in certain areas. Um, and, and likewise, if, if leaders are having a challenge in one part of their business or one part of their um, area of responsibility, it may actually be the opportunity for somebody under their um, leadership to grow and bring them in under their wing and, you know, problem hard, problem shared. And, and you can grow the business from there and themselves. Absolutely. That to me, this is um, um, it's it's all in in the the, the concept of um, um, delegate, not abdicate. Mm. You know, so mm. delegation is an opportunity to grow, uh, to grow others, uh, to develop others. Um, is an opportunity to actually help people discover their true strengths. And I think you said something where if somebody sees 
what needs to be done and no one is doing it. No one is even asking them to, to do something. Then at the end, they're like, well, wh why even bring it up? You know, I, one of the lessons I learned at a very young age, I was in a meeting. I had my key staff around me and I would go around, you know, asking my corporals and sergeants, you know, what do you think? What do you think? Then I got to, to one person and he, his name is Cristobal Perez. I love the guy. He's a very good friend. And he said to me something that I never forget at age 26 that changed my leadership style. He said, Ramos, what does it matter what I think if at the end you're going to do what's in your mind? Mm -mm -mm. Well, very, very, very powerful statement to make me realize. So when I give people a chance to listen, sorry, to talk, am I really listening? And there's a very thin line there between you letting someone talk, but then actually people seeing that you're taking their ideas and implementing them. Because as you said, they are the troops on the ground. They can see what's going on. And unless I, take their, I, I took their information or their insights, as a leader, I can end up making the wrong, the wrong decisions. And, and to really close that loop, yeah. the leader should go back and thank that person. Oh, amazing. And yeah. that often doesn't happen. So I can't tell you the number of times I've thanked Cristobal, and I'm, if he's listening to us right now, Cristobal, that one time you confronted me, I'm very thankful that took a lot of courage and a lot of trust, knowing if there was no trust between me and you, you would have never spoke spoke these words and it, it was that trust that maybe the leader instills within mm -hmm. within his people you know i'm approachable uh, i want to listen i care and uh, you know what uh, when 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 things are busy yeah i could i could have some mm -hmm. blinders so yeah i realized at the time i wasn't a great listener and thank you i'm forever thankful for that because that has 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 always come back to serve me not just in my business world but also in my in my family mm -hmm. world so Having built that trust with Cristobal goes back to something that I, I did naturally, which you then brought to me an analogy from the military. Tell me a bit more about this thing called a, is it a black book? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we had red and we have black. Let's yeah, see if we come up with more colors. So, so, so one of the things that um, was instilled um, in your training um, at Sandhurst was that you need to understand your men. You need to understand your men. Yeah. Um, and, and what that meant was that uh, you kept notes, positive notes, not negative notes, mm -hmm. positive notes, things like where they're from. Have they got brothers and sisters? Are they the oldest or the youngest? What does mum and dad do? Where do they live? Um, to sports and hobbies and interests and things like that. And the whole point of that was that when the soldier was having a morale issue or they've got a, a problem at home, you had a point of reference to perhaps open up the gates and let that soldier speak mm -hmm. in a little bit more confidence um, and be, be, be more transparent. And of course, in, in that process, when the soldier saw you being empathetic, by actually sort of saying, yeah, yeah, how are your mum and dad? Mm. You know, because uh, they live quite away from where where we're based, and I'm just wondering if, if they're affecting, you know, your your concerns about anything. Um, or you talked about a hobby or sport, it would break the ice and actually open that person up. Um, it's not a difficult thing to do now, you know, <laughs> with with GDPR and uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> all these uh, walls that we're uh, putting about um, information. The, the that often becomes a challenge in today's leadership. Mm -hmm. However, to be effective and, you know, without going into personal lives too much, I, I still believe that you can you can open up by saying sort of, how's the family? Are they all OK? You know? Have you actually got any concerns about the job? And, and to, to whatever extent, just that, convert, that, that question opens up the individual and they will share information. Yeah. You know, they will tell you about uh, maybe mom, dad, brother, sister, any personal scenarios, situations, goals, aspirations. I think, um, uh, you know, so, so here we're going back in, in the, in the, in the uh, military, um, let's say, environment. No, so even in, in a war, this is important. Now, mm. we are in business. It's a business war, if you were to call it that way. And, and 
isn't performance affected by how a person feels? Yeah, and, and look, I mean, yeah, I find it fascinating because you know, I've seen organizations, you know, here are our competencies, mm. and your performance is going to be measured on those. Mm. How often do you actually see the corporate values right. being reviewed in the performance review? Mm. That's a good one. Now, if you have corporate values and you set objectives, be them commercial or not, around those corporate values, what's that going to do to the business? I think the strongest competencies are those evolving around, you know, that bring out values element into them. The, the competency yeah. is the behavior, and the behavior can easily be reflected on, yeah. we want to work, uh, you know, uh, where, where you would say care about others. Well, care about others can be customer centricity, for example, and is this showing up? Yeah, and, and look, I mean, it's, it's a simple step to actually say, well, I've got my vision. I've got my mission and I've got my values. Now, if I'm actually going to make sure those values are lived on a day-to-day -day basis in the workplace, it's not about just describing the behavior and saying, this is what I'm expecting. It's actually, well, let's actually associate that behavior with a particular activity. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do that, why don't I go that one step further and make that an objective? Mm -hmm. Now, if I've achieved that objective, how would I enhance that objective? Well, what, what, you know, you've got customer centricity, great. What's a really advanced stage of customer ex centricity? Yeah. What, what does that look like compared to the basic? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to answer that. <laughs> I thought that was a question, but I think it's a rhetorical question. No, no, I'm going to ask you. Um, t t today, different levels of customer centricity. So today... Uh, you know, is, is what you're being, is what you're offering something that is a me too um, service? In other words, we are expected to pick up the phone or answer the phone when, when you call for a, uh, mm. uh, you know, a, a, a customer service department. Um, yet, is the interaction internally going to be as friction free? In other words, a lot of time the, the, uh, the call center will have their hands tied because they can't make certain decisions. And if I reflect on my experience maybe working with Emirates, I can go back to see how flexible the operators or these agents are, how, uh, how autonomous things are, where they're able to do, to go and uh, maybe maneuver around the, uh, the system, which gives me, the, the, uh, the user, an experience that I'm not basically in a, in a wall, but I'm actually being talked to or talked with as a, as a human being. So we go back to that, uh, to that question, is what you're offering a me too service or a me too support, or are you really thinking two steps ahead and giving the customer that wow experience, that wow factor, or that even unexpected factor to, uh, to that extent? And you know, when that customer service goes wrong, mm -hmm. you know, the business should be confident enough to have the values, its mission and vision played back to them. Mm -hmm. Right. And if people are not willing to accept that, <laughs> having it supposedly incorporated and employed it, then where's the problem? Therefore, maybe the values are not being lived appropriately. And uh, you know, how do you get those? So that's most probably going back to the leadership mm -hmm. to actually sort of say, well, what are the leaders doing to ensure that the values are being lived? Right. And are they actually setting a standard Mm -hmm. and serving their people with the values to the extent that people understand, yeah, that person does em employ that value well. Therefore, I will follow likewise. Mm -hmm. So there is a topic that I want to bring up here to you, Simon, where today um, people want to be customer-centric. They want to be number one, and they, in a way, ignore their number one uh, resources, and that's their people. Uh, so from one, side, from one side, there is a war on talent, and a war on talent is everyone is looking for these qualified individuals. Uh, and on the other side, organizations have this external goal, but their people aren't being taken care of the right way, uh, from a salary, from a remuneration, incentives, and things like that. So um, I, I remember one of the things that I used to do in, when I was in the direct sales business, and this has been part of my my, my values is, you know, what, what's, what's best for the individual? How can I make the individual comfortable so that they can go out and, and perform? Mm -hmm. And that question is, um, you know, it's, it surprises me. So, for example, let's say somebody, this is something I've had with one of my, my other uh, partners, Dr. Eli Daher, we were talking about. You know, let's say that 
uh, a sales professional is bringing in a million, a million dirham worth of a, uh, you know, monthly sales. Okay, um, and um, if if you pay them twenty percent more than what they're currently paid, what will that do for for their personal motivation, inspiration, perspiration? <laughs> you know, will they be able to? And plus, will that make them stop looking left and right to you know towards? Uh, Focusing more internally, mm. and and the answer is yes. And if someone is getting paid, maybe uh, more in line with what the market is getting paid, so so can they bring better results? So let's just say they bring twenty percent more more results, right? At you know at a certain margin. Let's say I pay someone from ten thousand, pay them uh, twelve thousand. So that's twenty percent, and they go from a million to one point two, at a twenty five percent margin on some products and services. What's 25% of an extra 200,000? Mm. Um, uh, that's 50,000. My investment for that was just spending 2,000 more. So if you look at the ROI, it's, it's quite interesting. Any, any comments on that? Uh, well, I, it's, it's a real com I think in, in the sales world where you've got definitive results, mm -hmm. um, the process um, becomes a lot clearer. Yeah. You know, it's performance-based. But when you're... You're dealing with support elements like a finance team or an HR team, um, those sort of elements. How do you ensure that they get a fair pay rise mm -hmm. um, when you've got the added complexity now of you know, people preferring to work at home or having a mixed environment? Mm -hmm. And then you've got the cost of obviously maintaining an office, and which is only 50% full because people decided to work at home. Therefore, their retention strategy is, well, if I can keep them, they keep productivity going, but it's still costing me. So their salaries, I can't decrease their salaries to offset the... So you can see all these sort of yes. complications. That's this just is, one example. This is recent complications um, and continuous complications. They're going to be here for a while. So I, I think at the end of the day, it goes back to... Um, and this is something I've... I've, I've always been sort of passionate. I get the need for qualifications because that proves that you can deliver, you can learn, and you can um, concentrate on um, you know, organizing yourself to create an output, be it academically or, or on the ground. But also there's one about attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes attitude is not taken into account when we're looking at people's performances. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me go back to the salesman that you've just described. For 50,000, um, for 2,000 more, he's generating 50,000. But that individual is leaving carnage in your sales team. Mm. And he's not off, off, off siding everybody. In. Right. Do you still want to employ? Probably not. But he's just bought you an increase in... So I think that's where values go back and play. That's where you realize, you know, is this is the way that the person is bringing this increment in line with the way we want to be seen? Uh, is he... So it goes back to then sort of saying, okay, if I can't sort of necessarily measure you by the amount of output that's actually having an impact, but I can measure you by your employment of the values, and you can give me clear examples of where you have employed that value and created a positive outcome. Why should I not give you a pay rise on that? Correct. Just a thought. You know, I had once um, an HR professional ask me, Ramis, have you ever had someone that displays the values, but then they don't get results? And I was like, I'd, I, that's impossible, because if you, this is, yeah. if, you dis, if you display the how, you're gonna get the what. And it's only a matter of time yeah. until this actually starts happening. So I, I'd, I'd say um, uh, being clear on the behavior that, uh, you know, on these values and the behaviors that are linked to these values is only a way of, of actually um, uh, prescribing your own recipe for success. Great. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this has been some fantastic insights for, for our uh, audiences today. Um, and maybe to kind of... Um, Top it off with just one last thing. One, one last thing. Um, so, of course, uh, setting a direction, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about where is north. Mm. Where is north? So, they, uh, you have people that have the right values, the right behaviors, but where are they going with that? So, what can you tell us about that? 
Yeah, I look, I, I think, you know, they often refer to it as your North Star, which is, you know, anybody who's into navigation, that's the one point in the sky which doesn't change. Mm -hmm. um, if you follow that, you're going to be going north. Um, so when you actually look at your business strategy, um, and I had a real interesting discussion the other day with, with, with a group of people who were saying, well, what's the difference between an agile growth strategy and a standard business strategy? Because both should grow, bring growth. And I said, yeah, but you know, with an agile business strategy, what, um, well, let's start with a standard business strategy. Often they're protracted goals over three to five years. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and everybody's working to those goals. Whereas an agile business strategy actually will take those goals down and, and chunk them down into smaller elements and distribute them around the people. And guess what? You've obviously got more involvement. You actually get more innovation and creativity because people are involved and saying, yeah, I know we've got to do that. How about if we go this way instead of that way? And of course, that brings, brings growth. And I think in today's business, you know, if, if you actually don't start thinking agile, um, it's going to be a virus that if you don't catch, you're not going to survive. I think you've got to, you've got to think that. And look, here's, here's a challenge which I'll, I'll, I'll offer people. You no doubt have a business strategy. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm not sure about this, no doubt. Okay, okay, but let's just assume people have that strategy. And in that strategy, they've got growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that growth might be financially, mm -hmm. it might be territorially, market-wise, it might be with their operations, it might be enhancing their people's capabilities, whatever it might be, you, right. you're going to have growth. Right. So my challenge is, if you've got that growth, does your organization remain as is mm -hmm. or is it going to be agile in getting that growth mm -hmm. so the question you know a simple analogy is you know an oil tanker takes five miles to turn when it's fully laden mm -hmm. five miles five miles it'll take five miles to turn mm -hmm. yeah when you go to the other extreme of a speedboat which can almost turn on a dime now somewhere in between is most probably an effective business so the question is how agile is your business to cope with the inevitable changes that are going to happen, be it with technology, customer needs, economic climate. Have you actually built in agility? Or are you sticking to those long-term goals and come what may, we're going to hit them? Touch of the First World War stuff. Mm. Go and hit, go, just go and take territory. Don't care how many people it takes. Right. Just go and take territory. And sometimes it's 100 meters for thousands of lives. So same in business. So to kind of wrap, <clears throat> to kind of wrap things up, I, I think this is a, a really great, uh, great question. Today, uh, change is happening at rapid, rapid rates. And today we got our dear friend ChatGPT, <laughs> where you can ask ChatGPT almost anything and can give you very live, uh, interesting, interesting insights. And Only from 2022, though. Yep. Not current. Only from 2022. Interesting. Backwards. So, so it's it's actually learning from what yeah. has what has happened before. So so of course there are there are some tools that can help uh, source information and help let's say answer questions. But what questions are you going to answer about the current status of your business, and what are you going to put in place in order to take the business from where it is today to where it needs to be? And are you going to have the right people? the right processes, the right technology, the right tools, and the right way, the right behaviors to actually get you there. Because the only one responsible for your success is you <laughs> and the way you lead, the way you manage, the way you set vision, mission, structure, and, and, and values and live by those values on a day-to-day -day basis is going to determine that ultimate destination you take your people with you. Agreed. So until next time, sell more, sell faster, and profitably.